Hi everyone! Tonight's video is an introduction to transcription, but I need to start tonight's video by talking about DNA. DNA contains the genetic code. The order of nucleotides in DNA, the A, C, G, and T, is a code that tells cells to tell their ribosomes in the cytoplasm what amino acids to use and in what order when assembling proteins. This means that DNA ultimately codes for proteins. But what about the other macromolecules? Shouldn't DNA code for the other three categories of macromolecules too? Well, enzymes are proteins, and enzymes can make lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. This means that DNA only needs to code for proteins, and those proteins can make the rest of the macromolecules required by the cell. I also need to address something called the central dogma. The central dogma states that DNA codes for a molecule called RNA, and then RNA codes for protein. Why is this a two-step process? Why can't DNA code directly for proteins? Well, the ribosomes, which assemble the amino acids into proteins, are found in the cytoplasm. But DNA never leaves the nucleus. It's too important. It stays protected behind the nuclear membrane. You can think of RNA like a disposable copy of the code in DNA. It has the same code as DNA, with one exception that we're going to talk about soon. RNA can leave the nucleus and bring the code to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm. So the first step in the central dogma is that DNA codes for RNA, and this is the process known as transcription. And transcription occurs in the nucleus. So how does this RNA differ from DNA? Well, first of all, let's look at the structure. RNA is a single-stranded molecule, and DNA forms a double helix. It is double-stranded. We can look at the bases in RNA and DNA. In DNA, we have C, G, A, and T. In RNA, we have C, G, A, and U. If you look at the difference between the T in DNA and the U in RNA, it's a difference of one methyl group that's on the T that is not present in the U in RNA. So in the case of RNA, U would pair with A, whereas in DNA, T pairs with A. We can also look at the sugars in the nucleotides. In DNA, the sugar is a deoxyribose. If you look at carbon number two, it has two hydrogens connected to carbon number two. If you look at the carbon number two in the sugar in RNA, which is called ribose, there is a hydrogen and a hydroxyl group. The DNA is missing the oxygen on this carbon number two, so it's a deoxyribose as opposed to a ribose in RNA. Finally, the location differs for both DNA and RNA. DNA is only found in the nucleus, and RNA is found in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So there are three types of RNA that are made by this process of transcription. The first is messenger RNA, or mRNA, and this contains the code for making proteins. Then there's ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. This is a component of ribosomes. As you recall, ribosomes have two subunits, and each of those subunits is made of a combination of proteins and ribosomal RNA. The final type of RNA is transfer RNA, or tRNA. And this is the molecule that actually translates the code in mRNA into amino acids, and it has this very characteristic three-dimensional shape. These three types of RNA work together to assemble amino acids in the, into proteins in the cytoplasm, and they're the subject of a different video on translation. Tonight, we are just talking about the process of how the cell makes these three types of RNA. So the enzyme responsible for transcription is called RNA polymerase. It has a very similar function to DNA polymerase. It reads the bases in DNA and puts complementary RNA bases in when it's reading the DNA bases. However, RNA uses a U to pair with A instead of a T as DNA polymerase does. So if we look at a molecule of DNA here currently being transcribed by an RNA polymerase, you can see that where there is an A in DNA, there is a U being put into RNA. RNA polymerase makes RNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So if we look at this new RNA molecule, 
the three prime direction would be here at the end where the RNA polymerase is working. It can only add to the three prime end, just like DNA polymerase. This RNA transcript is also made in an anti-parallel direction from the DNA. So the DNA would be on the three prime end here, and the, I'm sorry, the five prime end here, and the three prime end there. RNA polymerase is able to start de novo. It can start from scratch, so no primer is necessary. And it can also separate the DNA strands by itself, so no helicase is needed. There's a big difference between replication, or DNA synthesis, and transcription, or RNA synthesis. In DNA replication, as you recall, the cell copied the entire genome. With transcription, or RNA synthesis, the cell only makes a copy of one gene at a time. If we look at all the genes that are on a chromosome, you can see that this could be really hard for an RNA polymerase to find the correct gene to start if it's only doing one gene at a time. So how does RNA polymerase know how to find an individual gene to know where to start making a copy? Well, there's a specific sequence in DNA where RNA polymerase can bind to start transcription, and this is called a promoter. So we would define a promoter as a sequence in DNA that RNA polymerase recognizes and binds to start the process of transcription. Every gene includes a promoter, and that promoter is on the three prime end of each gene. So if we look at our double-stranded molecule of DNA here, Let's look just starting on the genes on this strand. There would be a promoter on the three prime end of each gene. And if we look at the other strand, which starts from the three prime going to the five prime, there would again be a promoter on the three prime end of each gene. Now RNA polymerase also has to know when to stop. So there's something called a terminator or a terminator sequence on the five prime end of each gene. So let's look here. We'd have a five prime end, a terminator sequence on the end of each one of these genes. DNA is double stranded, as you know. So which strand does the RNA polymerase read? And it does it matter which one? Well, let's look at our double stranded DNA molecule here. If RNA polymerase was reading this bottom strand here, it would see the T in DNA and it would put in an A and it would see an A in DNA, and it would put in a U. And we would end up with an RNA molecule with this sequence. However, if RNA polymerase read the top strand, it would see an A in DNA, and it would put in a U, and a T in DNA, and it would put in an A, and we would end up with this RNA strand, which is, of course, in the anti-parallel direction from the DNA strand. Now, because they are anti-parallel, it's really difficult to compare this sequence of RNA to this sequence of RNA. So let's take this RNA and flip it around so that it's in the five prime to three prime direction. And now if we look at the RNA that was transcribed from the bottom strand and the RNA that was transcribed from the top strand, you can see they're very different. So it matters which strand of DNA the RNA polymerase reads. The sequence of RNA that's made is different depending on which strand the polymerase reads. So how are we going to figure this out? Well, the strand of DNA that the RNA polymerase binds to and reads is called the template strand. In my class, I will always tell you which strand is the template strand. It will be labeled. So let's go ahead and I've labeled this bottom strand here, the template strand for this gene. The other strand that is not being read by RNA polymerase is called the coding strand. So let's label our coding strand. The reason for that naming, I'll explain it in a few minutes, but I have to admit it is confusing for students. Now, the promoter is on the three prime end of the gene on the template strand. So let's label the promoter. The promoter would be right here. So that means that my RNA polymerase is going to bind right here and it's going to start transcribing in the coding region. The coding region is the region of DNA that codes for RNA. It is transcribed into RNA. In my class, I am always going to indicate the coding region in a dark font. So you will know that the RNA polymerase binds here at the promoter, and you will know which nucleotide is the first nucleotide it reads because it will be the first dark font nucleotide. 
So through the process of transcription, the RNA polymerase will bind here at the promoter. It will read these nucleotides in the coding region. Where it sees a T, it will put in an A. Where it sees an A, it will put in a U. And we will end up with this sequence of RNA. Now let's get back to some of our naming. If you look at the sequence of bases in this transcript of RNA, the RNA transcript has the same code as the coding strand of DNA, except replacing the T's in DNA with the U's in RNA. Let's read this, the sequence in the coding strand. We have A, T, C, T. And in the RNA, we have A, U, C, U. This is called the coding strand because although RNA polymerase does not read this strand, it has the same code of nucleotides as the RNA that is generated by the RNA polymerase reading the template strand and putting in the base pairs. So you should know what is the central dogma, the four differences between RNA and DNA, the three types of RNA made by transcription, the enzyme RNA polymerase is responsible for reading DNA and making RNA, and you should know the characteristics of RNA polymerase. You should also know what's a promoter. Is it in the RNA or DNA, and what binds there? You should know what strand the RNA polymerase reads, the template strand or the coding strand. And finally, you should be able to make an RNA molecule using the base pairing rules, remembering to substitute a U in the RNA in the place of the T that would be in a DNA if you were given the template strand. So that's all for tonight.